Changing mindsets and receiving new philosophies can be challenging. To make things less stressful, we at Mental Shampoo give a light wash through dialogue that can help one clean up their mindset. And this season, it's all about the brothers. Tapping into the mind of a black man to share various experiences with hopes of helping more brothers have a change of heart and a cleaner mindset. So tap in for a fresh watch with the latest episode of Mental Shampoo. Yo, what's happening, man? It's Key Mark Kane coming to you all the way live. Your favorite country cousin, your favorite Mississippian, and your best friend. Ladies and gentlemen, look, we have made it so far within uh, Mental Shampoo season number two. And thank y'all for rocking with me, man. As y'all know, Mental Shampoo this season has been all about the black brother. And uh, I've been been talking with guys, you know, I don't want to say interviewing because these conversations have been life changing for me personally. Um, and I know, you know, they have been life changing for you all as well. And this one is going to be no different. So I'm excited to tap in with this whole conversation piece. Uh, wanting y'all to tap more into the mindset of a black man so y'all can see how we think. Y'all can see how we maneuver through life. You know what I mean? You can see the lessons that we've learned and also the lessons that we're teaching to not only our friends and our families, but to the younger generations that are coming up behind us and even the older generations. You dig what I'm saying? So today, man, we got my good brother. You dig CJ Rhodes in the building. What's going on? How you feeling today? All's well, brother. Glad hey, to be here. Yes, indeed. Look, there's no other way I wanted to end this season then with C.J. Rhodes, the doctor, the reverend, you know what I'm saying? Um, now, we're going to get into some things, of course, professionally, but we want to know about C.J. the man, C.J. the person. So tell me, you know, first and foremost, you know, uh, maybe three things that people may not know about Mr. Rhodes. Mm, wow. Uh, that's a good question. So maybe number one, I'm a big Star Wars fan. Okay. And uh, it's a <laughs> Third generational kind of th deal with me. My dad was a Star Wars fan, introduced mm -hmm. me to it. Now I've introduced my uh, sons to it. Nice. Um, also, when I'm by myself, I like to sing. Yeah. Particularly Luther Vandross. Hey. Or any kind of R&B, you know, yeah. circa 1980s through 1990s. That was like the golden That's age the, of R&B. Yes, indeed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and then third. Wow. Um, Love it. Well, some people may know this, others okay. may not. I'm actually an introvert and pretty shy at times. Okay. And so when I say that to folks, they say, oh, man, you can't be because you're always like, you know, you're preaching or always you're on radio friend. or something. Um, but, yeah, I've had a long history of social anxiety that actually growing up uh, meant that I would not speak well. I would stumble mm. over my words and all that kind of stuff. So it's amazing wow. that uh, that the very thing that was an issue for me growing up is the is the very – Kind of you know bread and butter part of my life uh, even now. Wow, we we uh we can definitely relate in that area because <laughs> a lot of people think that um that I'm a social butterfly and I can be when necessary, yeah. but I'm definitely an introvert. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I have I like to put myself in situations by challenging myself to uh be in situations where I have to work with others so mm -hmm. I can learn how to work better with others and yeah. learn how to communicate with them on that level uh so that's that's one of the reasons why i like to do things like the podcast and speaking and everything else yeah. so well you know the, the superpower of introverts is Talk that we me. we listen actively and deeply Absolutely. so you're this this conversation other conversations and i'm sure there have been strangers that mm -hmm. have been magnetized to you didn't mm -hmm. know them they gravitate to you sit down and tell like a whole life story yeah, i just killed somebody yeah <laughs> what are you telling me right <laughs> It, but is that is that deep, uh, that deep self awareness that, that introverts have? Yeah, that create a safe space for other people to say, "I can be vulnerable with you." That's heavy. And so I used to be ashamed of that, mm -hmm. and now I recognize again that is that has been with me as long as I can remember, and it's a gift to the world. The world is in many ways built for extroverts, mm. um, but is ran by introverts. Mm. So let's let's unpack that a little bit, like. You said that you were ashamed of it. Yeah. What made you ashamed of it? So, for one, you know, we, particularly in the 80s and 90s, had this kind of one-size-fits-all ideal of black masculinity. Mm. 
particularly as as hip hop gangster rap kind of was on the scene. I wasn't a football player, basketball player, or a rapper. Mm-hmm. I was the the nerd. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, and being the nerd, yeah. you know, in a culture that privileged braggadocio and, mm-hmm. and 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 loud guys, and you know, the guy who walks in the room is the class clown. Mm-hmm. I felt like something was lacking in me. Mm-hmm. You know, I needed to man up. So I would try to emulate that until I recognized later mm-hmm. that there was this interesting kind of line from, you know, my, my family through friendships where if anybody, if this is before ministry, mm-hmm. if anybody could listen to me without judgment is CJ. Mm. And so, wow, you know, it was this. And so I became like the, the Yoda, if you will, yeah. <laughs> among my peers. And, and it really has just been the last maybe seven to 10 years mm-hmm. I've recognized that it's something I don't need to change about myself. Wow. That that I am, that, and, and that's a, a portion or a part of black masculinity that we just don't see as much anymore. I, I posted recently, we may, you know, debate about this, but, mm-hmm. um, you know, growing up, you know, just about R&B, mm-hmm. in the 80s and 90s, we had a lot of variety. Mm-hmm. We had variety in hip hop, we had variety in R&B. And now most of the music we're listening to, at least mm. like younger kids, it ain't got no love in it. it you know, no facts. You know? <laughs> and and so it therefore makes it more difficult yeah. to be the sensitive black guy. Yeah. And and so reclaiming that and honoring that and saying, you know, mm. we can be that and be okay with that, I think is a is a, a recent revelation for me. Man, I will say that there is some music. You got to dig a little deeper in the crates, though, yeah. y'all, <laughs> for the music that talks more about love rather than just the uh, the marketing things of music. Uh, but definitely, the, the '90s, like, ain't nobody doing no Jodeci cry for you no more. Yeah. Like that's that's out that's out the window. Uh, and I was just asking, like, whatever happened with with groups? I was having that conversation recently. Like, whatever happened with like all the the groups? Yeah, you know yeah, what I mean. Yeah. Serenading and things of that nature. It's like we lost a lot of that. Uh, and, and as as I'm thinking, as I'm talking, I'm thinking about even with some of the generations that are dying off. Yes, you know, a lot of things that are not being taught to us from the older generation they're dying with it that's right and that's leaving us out here stuck that's right so a couple of things i want to ask with you uh first talking about masculinity how would you define manhood and then secondly you know how can we actually you know fix or undergird um you know being better at teaching or building the bridge of those intergenerational relationships yeah so maybe one way of thinking about masculinity it's i would i would say one word responsibility <laughs> that to be a man is to take responsibility for your life and the lives of others ah. um so again I, you know that's not it shows up in different ways, right? Yes, sir. So we're responsible in ways that we may protect or provide or whatnot. But if you begin with that stuff, mm-hmm. then you get locked in these gendered roles mm-hmm. that it must mean you are a mechanic or it must mean that you, you know, knock it down 20, you know, as opposed to going back and saying, no, no, a more mature approach is saying that, you know, like Paul says in scripture, when I was a child, I did childish things. When I became a man, I put yeah. those childish things away. For sure. And and that to me means responsibility. It means that I think about my place in the world and, and use my power, authority, and influence in responsible ways. I take accountability mm-hmm. for the things I do and don't do. And I understand that it's not just about me, it's about others, it's about my family, it's about you know the community. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so when we, for instance, when people say, where are the brothers at? What they're really saying are who are the ones who are trying, you know, taking responsibility for the way things are. Yes, we know there's the system. Yes, we know that all kinds of things are against us. Yeah. But when you know when men step into that that recognition of responsibility, you know, people get in line. I think about again, you know, being a father and just thinking about my presence and sometimes voice in my son's life. It 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 does something. Something turns on and there's a dad that just said something. Mm-hmm. How does that look when men show up in other places? Not in an abusive way, right? Mm-hmm. Not in a, you know, bragging kind of way, but in a way that says there's a responsibility I have to mm-hmm. show up in the world and 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 um, 
help make things better. Mm-hmm. And so intergenerationally, better models of that from the previous generations, baby boomers, Gen Xers, I think are required to be in dialogue with millennials and Gen Z that are seeing at least less um, um, popular models of that, mm-hmm. right? So when we think back to the old school, you think about, you know, the hardworking granddad, or mm-hmm. you think about, you know, we, you know, we think about, you know, we think about Malcolm X, Martin Luther King. Why, why are teenagers mm-hmm. so attracted to a Malcolm X figure or a Martin King figure? Yeah. So they see something in them that they want to emulate, yeah, and that they don't necessarily see around them. And that's partly because we don't have intergenerational conversations. Anymore. That's a fact. Yeah, you know, um, I'm sure your experience was you had older men and women in your life mm-hmm. who passed down some wisdom. Absolutely. Well, what happens? You know, we're the kind of old kids. Like I'm, I'm, I just turned forty, mm-hmm. and I'm teaching students who are in their teens and early twenties. Mm-hmm. I'm old school to them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. And some of them have not had a baby boomer in their life. Yeah. Who showed, you know, so we have to create spaces where these different generations come together, learn from each other, glean from each other, and ultimately say, this is what it means for me in my own generation and time to take responsibility. Mm. Um, man, that's good. Responsibility and holding that space. Um, I was having a conversation recently <clears throat> with one of my uncle cousins. He's really mm-hmm. my uncle. I mean, yeah. he's really my cousin, but yeah. he's like old, the older guy. Yeah, yeah older yeah. guy, right? And so we was on the grill, just having a bonding moment. You know what I mean? And uh, while we on the grill, my mother happened to be in the, in our presence also. And so you know, they were having the conversation of you know what's gonna happen. You know, your mom passed. You know, or I passed, and things like that. What's gonna happen with the land? What's gonna happen with the house? Blah 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 blah. blah. And it's like you know. I said, we're going to take care of it. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And a lot of us, granted, you know, me coming back from Atlanta, being back in Mississippi for a little while now, you know, uh, as I mentioned to you off camera, like it could have been a better time than that I came back to Mississippi. Uh, I have a greater feeling, you know, being close to two family, having that help whenever needed or necessary and being that help whenever I'm needed also. Yeah. Right. Uh, but one thing that he said that really kind of struck a nerve, he had mentioned that, you know, because I asked about, you know, the the relationships with the older and the young, mm-hmm. right? Give give the young give the younger generation what they need in order to keep up whatever needs to be kept up. Yeah. He had mentioned along the lines of like, you should just be watching what I'm doing and then you should just do it. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? And quite frankly, that is how a lot of the older generation yeah. thinks. But but I mentioned to him, you know what I mean, to to not assume that I'm just supposed to do something just because I'm right. sitting here watching you do it. Now, granted, you know, of course I picked up some things and I gave him an example. Like I learned a lot about cars from him yeah. and I'm able to do things with my car and help other people with their cars because I was just in that space and, and seeing that, but like other responsibilities, it's like, Hey, you know, when we had these family trips, we we together for about a week and some change or maybe, and pick out a day to just have a family meeting and like set expectations like this is what's going on you know this is this is going on they're getting older you guys are growing up this needs to happen and that's what i mentioned to him like that's how that that's how i see that kind of working right i think that i think that conversation models what we need in terms Mm -hmm. of absolutely baby boomers in particular are really big on apprenticeship Mm -hmm. just just you know my dad assumed i would be an attorney just because i would be around him every now and again mm-hmm. in his legal practice. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, but you never sat down and talked to me about A, B, and C about mm-hmm. this. So I kind of saw the bad side. I saw you up late writing briefs. I'm like, I don't want to do that. Yeah. Now that I'm older, I'm like, that's kind of cool, right? Yeah. But, you know, having um, that intergenerational conversation where we say, look, some of this is about apprenticeship. Mm-hmm. In ministry, for instance, it used to be the case that if you were a younger man driving the older preacher, it was in those moments of maybe even overhearing him talking to another preacher that you gained certain wisdom about what to do and what not to do. Mm, yeah. A, 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 I won't call it a problem, but a missing element though, is that lacks reflection. Mm. Right. So the reason why we need to have that conversation is I don't need to know just what you did. I don't, I don't know how you did it, why you did it that way. <laughs> right. Because, how, why? yeah, right. Be, right. You know, it, it's, it's the purposeful why, 
And that's what I try to do with my sons now. Like they ask all like, oh my God, they just ask too many questions. Yeah. <laughs> but it's me trying to think about, they're trying to figure out aspects mm -hmm. that well, maybe responsibility, I think are necessary if the event came when I'm no longer here. Mm -hmm. If your uncle weren't there, mm -hmm. hypothetically, somebody else has to take care of that land. True. One of the problems we're seeing is too much of our wisdom is dying with our elders. Man. Or maybe not our elders. Maybe, you, you know, someone got killed in some kind of gun violence or a car wreck or mm -hmm. whatnot. And now you got a whole generation of folks who know something needs to be done but don't know how to do it. And then older folk blaming them for not stepping into the role. Mm -hmm. They don't know that I'm supposed to do X because no one ever said, this is your birthright. Yeah. You come of age, you must step into this. Going back to my Star Wars uh, piece I said earlier, one of the things I appreciate about Star Wars is, and I'm sure this is in other cases too, like, you know, karate movies, et cetera, mm -hmm. the hero's journey begins with meeting a mentor at some point mm -hmm. who sees more in you than you see in yourself yeah. and helps you work through all the mistakes you're going to make mm -hmm. to bring you to a point when he or she's no longer there. Mm -hmm. You got to stand on your own. But you stand on your own in this moment because you've been prepared for it mm -hmm. because of that relationship, because of that dialogue. Um, and so I think when we have more of that, you know, we'll see particularly younger men rise to the occasion. It can't just be your, you know, you got male genitalia, stand up. I don't know what that looks like. I don't like. know what that, yeah. Wow. Yeah. And, and man, man, this is good. I was reading Luke 6 and 40 earlier this morning, and it read that uh, pretty much the student and the teacher, and that if the student pretty much studies how he's supposed to, he'll be like the teacher or something to that effect. You know what I mean? So just having that guidance, that structure, and then even the book, The Alchemist, how the alchem how uh the brother was going on his journey in that way. It's it's crazy how even with Wu Tang clan, the rap mm -hmm. group, mm -hmm. you know, they were inspired by uh martial arts and yep. things. And the Wu is is dealing with a certain aspect and then the Tang, you know, that's dealing with the sharpness of their lyrical ability mm -hmm. within their music. So it's 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 phenomenal to see how Star Wars, martial arts, you know, how all those things kind of can tie in. That's what I can appreciate about appreciate about the arts just in general. Yeah, yeah. It's always lessons within that. That's right. I was not in anime whatsoever. <laughs> My nephew, shout out to William, he's 14. Um, he's big in the anime. And one time I actually just sat and watched an episode with him. And I was mind blown. I'm like, dude, it was so many life lessons in that yeah. one episode. Yeah. It's like, yeah, he says all of them are like that. That's right. And that's why, like, contributing, because he's a avid reader. Buddy reads like crazy. But then even in addition to that, you know, watching the anime, it's like, dude, no wonder why you're so smart. Like, yeah. you're getting yeah. all these lessons from, I was watching cartoons and in hindsight now. I, it, back then it was entertainment but now when i can watch <laughs> yeah. it it's like some stuff even in the stuff that i was watching but i wasn't checking for that right. he's actually getting the entertainment and the education at the same time right. you right. know what i mean so i love that for my guy um and <clears throat> now that he's getting older i'm definitely uh going to be bringing him more underneath my wing to uh, show him some things because although I did receive some great wisdom from some of my elders, quite frankly, I don't think I received enough. Mm, you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. And so it's and, like, and, and I would interject there and say, and, and as I've grown older, mm -hmm. I recognize that some of them couldn't give you that. And some of it's not that you didn't receive it. It's just, they didn't get it. They didn't get it. So it's like, I can't be hard yes. on you because your daddy didn't give it to yes, you. Yes, And man. you were doing the best you could That's a fact. with the hand you were dealt. That's a fact. And, and I think part of part of what we have to do as black men, mm -hmm. um, we have to learn to forgive the ignorance of our fathers and the men in our lives. I had to do that. Yeah. Like, you you, you were a 20 some year old guy trying to raise three kids and you working, you know, you good times living in the project. You know? Yeah. And, and, and so, but again, that, but, We've got to live long enough to get to that point where we start to reflect. That's that you know what they did. They did what they could. They were mm -hmm. trying their best to hold it down. Imperfect as they were, mm -hmm. we've been imperfect, but they did the best they could. So now that we know that, the lesson is now: how do I improve upon that for the next generation? Mm. That's so good, and that requires in part self self reflection, yeah. introspection, mm -hmm. which is something that 
a lot of us don't, going back to introverts, mm-hmm. introverts know how to do that almost innately. Yeah. You know, we probably <laughs> think too much. Too know? much. I definitely overthink. <laughs> I overthink for sure. Yeah, yeah. but that introspection allows you to get the clarity you need about not only your sense of purpose, your mm-hmm. why, yes, sir. but then how to articulate that to others and mm-hmm. then help them articulate what their why is. Big facts. Big facts. Um, when my father passed in t- April 2020, a month before his birthday, mm-hmm. uh, I resented my dad a lot. Wow. Right? Wow. Because he wasn't there the way that I thought he should be. But then it's like closer to his death and then after his death, or transition rather, uh, I began to learn more about his life. You know what I mean? And understand like, hey, yeah, maybe you were doing the best mm-hmm. with what you with what you knew and what you could do. Yeah. And it's like now it's kind of a burden lifted off in that aspect because there was a lot of questions that I want to answer. Mm. But it's like, well, maybe he didn't have the answer or knew how to answer it. So I began to give my give my man more grace in that aspect. And then it's, I had to think, too, I just made 32 this year. He was 31 when I was born. Mm. So it's like, mm. dude, and, uh, and he already had other kids, my other okay. siblings okay. before me. Yeah. So it's like, hmm, if I was 31 with me and some other kids, would I have been able to do what he's done? Would I have been able to do more? Things like that. So I started to be more considerate with both of my parents, actually. Yeah. Not just my dad. Uh, I feel like I was, I, ha- I had more resentment towards my father because, you know, like father, like son type uh, things. Yeah, yeah. And then I see some of my friends who had their fathers, you know, uh, how they would interact and things like that. But then even in college, I even would learn that just because you have a two parent household, that doesn't necessarily mean everything's going to be all peachy and cream, too. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that, that actually made me think about something. You know what the number one killer of black men is? Talk to me. Comparison. Woo. Okay. So many I ain't going to lie. I thought you were going to say, like, heart disease. <laughs> <laughs> that's the, that, that, yeah, that's the result of comparison, right? <laughs> but you made me think about how so many of us fail to see more fully who we are and what we've received because mm. we're comparing what we have compared to what we think somebody else has. Yes, sir. And let's be, let me go a little deeper and how a lot of times as black men in relationships with our you know girlfriends, our mm. wives, our children, whoever, they're comparing us to other folks. They're mm. measuring us up. And, and yes. so that creates a context where we can't be vulnerable. <sighs> so we feel like I'm not measuring up to this thing. Your My daddy didn't measure up. My uncle didn't measure up. And and so, yeah, the, the, the consequences of mm-hmm. comparison oftentimes mm-hmm. are the kinds of behaviors that do lead to heart disease and mm-hmm. suicide and homicides, et cetera, because we don't recognize the gift that we are, mm-hmm. that that regardless of what you received or didn't receive, you are in a Kamar as you are. Yeah, you are enough. Jeez. Because part of the. The flip side of that whole responsibility piece, the the shadow side, the dark side, Mm -hmm. is that very often we confuse uh, that with being a human doing. So Mm -hmm. I got to keep doing something to prove my value. Yes. Whatever that is. Yeah. Hustling, workaholic, producing, whatever it is, and not stopping long enough to say, you know, if I don't do anything else, Mm -hmm. I am enough. Amen. That's heavy. That's so heavy. That's so good. Cause you know, we do, we do draw a lot of attention to ourselves from outside and, you know, we get a lot of motivation from certain titles that we hold. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So that human doing, that's what I think about like, Hey, Oh, this person's a doctor. This person is an athlete. They make X amount of dollars. And they, and a lot of times that'll make, you know, that they will make that their identity, yeah, which right. is why I think a lot of I hear NFL players talk about it a lot. Like, and even some kids that have played ball in high school or college, and then when they're not playing no more, a lot of them kind of lose themselves yeah. because "quote unquote" ball is life. Yeah, that's right. right. That's right. Um, I want to talk more about my mind is really stuck on this self awareness piece because I self reflect all the time, mm-hmm. every day. I journal every day. Um, I want to know what does self-awareness look like for you? Like, how do you reflect 
you know, what has helped you get to the point of learning more about yourself, so on and so forth. Yeah. So to begin with, I'm a very philosophical person. And again, this has been who I've been on my whole my whole life. Um, and for me, it, it begins with why questions. Mm. Um, mm. You know, and and so as a result of that, I don't journal as much, but I do a lot of, you know, don't call me crazy. I talk to myself a lot. Oh, I do that too. <laughs> <laughs> I talk to myself all the time. And I tend to talk my way clearly through some whatever blockage I'm dealing with. Yes. It's it's it, it's like a blend. Sometimes it's like a blend of prayer and 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 self-talk. Wow. Like I'm talking to the Lord and then mm-hmm. I'm like talking through something. I'm re- I'm rehearsing what I should have said in a moment mm-hmm. and I didn't say mm-hmm. and I'm talking it through. And then at some point whether that's me in the house or mm-hmm. on a nature walk or whatnot, I come to an aha moment. Mm-hmm. Um of how it was a teachable moment, right, mm-hmm. for for me. Um, so having that capacity to, in a certain sense, say, what do I need to do to get better? Mm-hmm. And talking my way through that mm-hmm. has often been very, very helpful. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing I've done, too, I've done this actually more in recent years than in, because, I, because I'm such an introvert uh, and introspective type person, I didn't always recognize that I also needed other people to talk through things with. Yeah. Because we do have blind spots. <laughs> Even though we're, you know, wonderful extrovert uh, introverts. Yes, sir. You, you're just going to miss something. Yep. And so what I've learned more recently is to have various conversation partners who are my age peers, mm-hmm. little older, much older, little younger. Yep. And just engaging with them and being vulnerable and humble enough to hear their questions, not as an attack, mm. but as an opportunity for me to reflect even deeper in an area that, that I didn't really recognize. Mm. Um, and so for me that, you know, in, in one philosophical school of thought, it's called stoicism. And so it's, it's, yep. this, it's just this sort of even tempered demeanor, yep. right? Where for me, and it kind of pisses folk off, I, you can't really get me mad quick. Now, I mean, I could get mad, yeah, but it's usually because I'm always open to What's the wisdom in this? What can mm. I learn from this? Yeah. And and even as I've helped other people, you know, work through their stuff, it's always me being open to even that uh, can help me think through, you know, whatever roadblock I'm, I'm facing. So mm. talking to myself, talking to others, talking to God, that's often been the way man. that I work through whatever the thing is. We twins, man. <laughs> I got three solid brothers that that's my corner mm. because mm. I do these things called prayer walks. Yeah. I go to a I park it. and I walk two miles, nice little brisk walk. Sometimes I pray in my head. Sometimes I'm actually walking and talking yep. out loud. Yep. No headphones in because I leave my phone or whatever in the car. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Nobody looked at me crazy yet, but I be <laughs> I, like, I'm having a whole conversation with myself while I'm walking and praying. Yeah. Yeah. And I, again, I got my three solid brothers uh, who I lean on. Shout out to my guys, man. They've helped me through some situations. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then, of course, the big God. Like, you know, God, what we doing? You know what I mean? Yeah, so yeah. it's like, I'm like you too, um, where, you know, it takes a lot to get me upset. But once I'm there, I'm there. Only a, yeah, ver- a yeah. very few people have seen it. Uh, but then when I say, uh, it's, it's like some people get shocked or something if they hear that. I don't like something. I don't like somebody. It's like, mm. dude, I'm human. You know what yeah, I mean? I know yeah. everybody don't like me and I don't like everybody. And that's okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's like uh, some people would be like, oh, can you mad? You upset? Like, can I do I not have emotions? You wow, know what I mean? Wow. But uh, even with that, you know, I really and I talked about it quite a few times on here. Uh, Brene Brown, I've been studying a mm. lot of her work yeah. because I'm looking to master social and emotional intelligence absolutely you know what i mean yeah, yeah. uh because like life is about i don't know if you ever seen the movie collateral beauty with will smith mm-hmm. check it out whenever you get some time but i live by that quote he says he says that life is about people so if life is about people i need to learn how to better deal with people and i need to like become the best version of myself to give people the best of myself yeah you know what i mean so uh, so one I'm, thing with that that I 
have been joking with my friends about is when I've turned 40, it's like some little switch turned on. Mm. And part of this reflection period has been recognizing how much I felt the need for everybody to like me. Mm. So much so that I chopped off parts of who I am. Mm. You know, um, I've dumbed myself down in some spaces. Wow. Um, I've I've muted some of my spiritual depth in some certain spaces. Okay. Um, I've not expressed a political view I may have that goes counter everybody. Right. And I would do that because I didn't want to deal with I was being conflict avoidant. Mm. Um, which in some ways ties back to childhood. My parents were divorced when I was six. Mm. I was the diplomatic Rep, you know, son out of, you know, six kids. And so I took that with me the rest of my life. And then at age 40, something just turned where I was like, I don't really care that much about what people have to say. Yeah. You wow. know? <laughs> and so great. reflecting on why did it happen at 40? And, yeah. and talking to other 40, and like, wait till you turn 50, man. It gets even better. <laughs> you care even less about what people have to, you know, and just That's thinking cool. about, you know, so in my 30s, it was all about, you know, trying to make everyone okay mm. and the problem with that Kane, is that at some point i stopped being okay Ooh, <laughs> talk about that talk about that yeah i mean it's because it, you, you, one of the things that and i think i know the term you know we talk about introversion empaths yeah empathic people tend to care so much about other people yeah man and then recognize the lack of reciprocity and it's hard to pour into other people when you're not being poured back into oh my god <laughs> right and they expect but they expect you like i'm coming here for refreshment you need to have it like well i, ain't, I mean i'm not a i'm not a, a geyser like right. i'm a picture yeah i gotta be poured in too big thanks yeah and you know i hit a moment actually at age 39 i started to i think i had this weird uh i guess fetish or the fact that a lot of the folks I looked up to in history died at 39. Mm. So Martin, Malcolm, and, and, and Meg all died before they turned 40. Mm-hmm. I had two older brothers who died before you know, early 40s. Um, and through the pandemic, you know, a lot of my friends were dying. Mm. And then I had COVID, survived it. But every day I'm hearing all these stories about friends dying. And for whatever reason, I got closer to 39 I, I mean, I was like, man, like, I, I feel like I'm burned out. Mm. I've been doing, I'm going, 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 going. Um, in a hit that I, I lionized sacrificing for others, even to my detriment. <sighs> and I had to be okay with the fact that self-care was liberation. Come on. Like that. If I need to step away, yes, if I need to go on a trip, you know, um, that is okay. Mm-hmm. And it, it's hard. There was a way I think I learned manhood that said it's never about you. Mm. It's always about other folks. Mm-hmm. But then when those other folks don't see the value that you placed in that relationship with, you know, which then you start to go, what? Okay, wait a minute. Mm-hmm. So I'm doing all the sacrificing. I'm showing up and doing it. Good example. So I had a conversation uh, we gone through about a year and a half of the pandemic. You know, a lot of pastors, we were doing all kinds of stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, I became a cinematographer, videographer, sound guy, all the, <laughs> and still got to prepare and preach a message. Yeah. And I was just tired, like, once we started kind of coming back into the building. Mm-hmm. And so I let my associates preach for a month. Mm-hmm. I had some people saying, like, you know, people going to leave if you, they, you ain't preaching. And I was like, so you mean I help walk us? I help walk the church. <laughs> we didn't lose anybody to COVID. We were doing better financial. I mean, all this, and you just gonna you gonna leave because I ain't preaching. Because I ain't. Pre- I, so it like oh, so nothing I do will ever be good enough for wow. you not to walk away. Wow. So I gotta be okay with folk who walk away. Wow, that's heavy. I don't want to preach, but no, please do. I think about <laughs> the timing of when the father says to the son, uh-huh. you know, this is my son, my beloved son, with whom I'm well pleased. Yep. This happens at the beginning of his public ministry, not the middle or the end. Mm. And I think it's because the father's reassuring the son, before you do any of this other stuff, mm. I, I got you. I love you. 
I love you before your cross. I love you before your miracles. I love there's something about God being pleased with us before we do anything to earn his pleasure. Come on. <laughs> oh. And so when you get that revelation. Yes, sir. It changes the way you. In- so it's not that you hate people. It's like you love them differently. You understand that it's not some transactional. I need you to be OK with me as I give you the. It's if you walk away, that's fine. Like, yes. I don't end being who I am. And you don't end being this. This just oh, may be man. the season of departure. Oh, man. And once you awaken to that, mm-hmm. it liberates you to to live fully in what God has called you to be such that you can be like Paul says, am I a pleaser of God or a pleaser of people? Mm. Um, and so, you know, we we're talking off, off air, off camera about, you know, coming full circle in your life. Mm-hmm. I think for me, coming full circle has been recognizing it was like you like man, I like to speak and I like to write and mm-hmm. I you know sermons books whatever all that and if I could do that for the rest of my life I'm good I'm a happy soul yeah <laughs> and but I had to get to that point because that's not everyone's vision for my life mm. other folk want to be, be, be an attorney or do this and do that and again once you compare yourself to all these other options in life and mm-hmm. not all right but let me be clear about my call mm-hmm. my lane uh, you know, if you don't do that work, you you get stuck, you burn out. Uh, but if you do the work, mm-hmm. it I'm telling you, it's like a, it's like turning on a dime. You you start to, it's almost like putting on glasses. You see the world differently. Mm-hmm. You see your relationships differently, and it gives you the freedom mm-hmm. to be okay with folk not liking you. Big facts, <laughs> man. This is good. I hope y'all got some uh, some pen and paper out for real, for real, and definitely rewatch. Um, I want to dig deeper into spirituality. I want to talk uh, what got you into ministry. Mm. Uh, I've been knowing Pastor Rhodes here for probably, I don't remember initially when we first met, but it, I'll probably say about eight years or so ago. Um, but this guy has been a staple in the community for so many years, for as long as I've known him. Uh, so let's let's kind of get to the to the beginning stages of you recognizing that you wanted to get in ministry. Yeah. So um, kind of the backdrop of that story is that um, in my preteens, I, I became basically an agnostic. Mm-hmm. I was asking all these questions and and. Um, and it wasn't until about 16, 17 that I had like a real encounter, like mm-hmm. this this real big encounter that confirmed for me, um, you know, the truth of the gospel. Mm-hmm. Without that experience, that encounter, I probably still would be a wanderer in some ways. Mm-hmm. But it also helped me to reimagine what the gospel is and what church, like, you know, some people are just born into a particular context yeah the church for instance and yeah. they just do church because that's what everybody else did and they do it unreflectively mm-hmm. so that journey helped me to reflect and go deeper but even at that time i was like on fire for god but like i was going to be an international attorney mm. um so ironically um i got into the university of mississippi for the international studies uh program okay that's why i went that in the tulips <laughs> I went. I really wanted to go to Morehouse, but that's a whole nother. I'll, we, we can talk about that. Yeah. Uh, uh, but went, got there for international studies because I was planning to be an international attorney. Mm-hmm. In the same year that I graduated, and on my way to the, to the University of Mississippi, I get this call, okay. and it's like this radical like vision, and like I tell my mom, and she's like not really impressed. She's like, "What are you gonna do for real though? Like, yeah, you're gonna they're preaching stuff cool, but." Cause we never really saw it. Uh, I don't think. Well, at least for her, yeah. never saw an image of something beyond a bivocational pastor, right? You know, usually in, in small towns, you know, pastors pour mouth and eating the fried, the best part of the fried chicken as a family <laughs> out, and then, you know, and, and and frankly, she didn't have the highest esteem of pastors because she, you know, saw some preachers do stuff they shouldn't be doing. So right. she was like, "Yeah, okay, it's a phase or whatever. You'll go out of it." told my dad he was saying something about are you from the tribe of levi i'm like you my dad i mean you should know you know no no one really in my family was really like (laughs) hip to the notion of me being a preacher yeah uh i told local pastor he said yeah what you just shared me that's clearly a call from the lord but because i was on my way to college i kind of suppressed it Mm -hmm. because i was like 
this is my first time being free from the house, you know, you know, I'm about to go and I was really a party guy, but uh, I probably should say this, okay, but I love women, you know. For sure. I, was, I was like, <laughs> I'm about to go to this whole new world, it's a whole new, yeah, but I got this call in the back of my mind. Mm-hmm. And so I'm wrestling with that and I didn't tell anybody, but God kept sending these prophetic voices who were mm-hmm. like, God said, stop lying. Mm. Folk went around like, what the hell? Like, I thought you were just like this nerdy dude. Like, I didn't... and um, so I was like, okay, I'm a, I'm a test this thing for real. So we were uh, a colleague of mine in the Student Government Association. We were heading to the University of Georgia mm. to study their student government, and I had my Bible with me. I said, all right, we can pass on the seat. I open this Bible up, and whatever I turn to, if it don't really jail with yeah. calling, yeah. I, I'm just gonna put it on the back shelf. Yeah. Crack the Bible open and the page falls to Jeremiah chapter one. Talk to me. Verse five. Before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you were in a danger to be a prophet to the nation. Ah. So I said, I can't fight that. <laughs> that sounds like, you know, pretty on point. Yeah. <laughs> and from there, that was like um about October, November of, of two thousand mm-hmm. and just went full fully in and and kind of saw both the call to church ministry, but also this kind of public square piece. And so mm-hmm. A lot of racial uh, incidents were happening at Ole Miss, and I would, you know, be called upon to lead and to serve. In a ver- so nice. it was interesting how I was able to, you know, in this kind of Kingian, you know, Martin Luther King kind of way, you know, with the, to the church in in the public square, um, and um, and that's really kind of been it. And uh, and and it's and, and you know, over time, it has shown up in different ways. Mm-hmm. You know serving other pastors or ultimately being a senior pastor, serving at a, you know, HBCU as a chaplain. Um, but ultimately at the root of it, it was that uh, experience in July of 2000 of mm-hmm. knowing that the Lord, you know, summons me. Wow. And I had no other choice but to say yes. That's heavy. You said something uh, key in terms of like the social aspect as well as the spiritual aspect mm-hmm. that the MLK of it all question that's been like brewing as of late right what is the black church role in everything that's like happening unjustly Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know what i mean i feel like personally black people now we don't have enough grit Mm. like we did back then back then it was a common goal to vote to get free to to uh, whatever the case, right? It was a common goal. I don't feel like we as a whole have a common goal anymore. And everybody is out for self. There's mm-hmm. there's space for self, but then ultimately, like, what is the end goal or the common goal for all of us, yeah. right? And I know from personal experience and just seeing you throughout the years that you are what you talk about. Mm-hmm. Like, you, you are about, you, you, you walk the talk. But a lot of others, they're kind of like standing in the background. Mm. So I guess what I'm trying to ask is how can other leaders, spiritual leaders or religious leaders, get more involved uh, with what's happening? Because that's where a lot of blacks got our faith in that aspect, too, yeah. by seeing what was going on. Yeah, so I think a couple of things. One. I think we often romanticize the 50s and 60s as if all the black churches were marching. Mm. And the reality is only about 3% of black churches were actively engaged. Interesting. So if we're going by those numbers, I think we're kind of on par, maybe even more uh, uh, now. That said, I think your your particular critique is well noted. Um, I was, before coming here for uh, for the conversation at a funeral, and it was for a a very seasoned woman, former first lady of a church mm-hmm. whose husband who died before her was a um, state Baptist and national Baptist leader. Mm-hmm. And it was something about the regalness that they discussed about the now deceased and what role the church, like it was, it felt different. Mm-hmm. Like the black, ch- it, it was like it, w- because we couldn't have access to much else, mm-hmm. the black church was where, where everything happened. Mm-hmm. And so we looked to our pastors in particular as our presidents, as our mayors, because we didn't have that access. I think what happened is that we, uh, integration in many ways seduced us into thinking that we had arrived. Mm. 
And and particularly as a church, we began to bequeath a lot of that to those black folk who were moving into. So think about it, 70s, 80s, 90s, we got more black folks led to mayorship and city councils. And, and so I think a lot of, frankly, a lot of black church folks said, uh, pastors said, you take it from here. But I think the unique contribution that the church had then and continues to have now or should have is that we are still the spiritual and moral anchor. Mm. So it's not just about us like marching in the streets, though I think we should do that, or you know, you know, marching to the suites, though I think we should do that. It's about making sure our folks remember that it is not just about ourselves, mm. right? Um, and I think that message has has also been lost. Um, you know, I was thinking about this some time ago, even back in the day, growing up in Hazelhurst, Mississippi. Even folk who didn't go to church, let's just like like gangsters. Mm-hmm. They were killing people. They shouldn't have been doing that, but they still had a code mm-hmm. that they had to live by. Like mm-hmm. there were certain folk they weren't going, they weren't going to shoot up grandmama. They weren't going to steal from the church. Mm-hmm. Somehow we've lost that as a as a quote unquote black community. No, where it's no etiquette, no ethics, no etiquette, no ethics, because it's you know we're we're capitalistic, consumerist, materialistic now. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I think one part of the role of the church is to remind folks to reclaim that. And I think, you know, frankly, I think that's why a lot of younger black folks are pursuing a lot of spiritual alternatives because they don't see deep spirituality in the church. Wow. Yeah. So they're saying, well, yeah, I like, ain't nothing going on here. So let me go over here and get it from over here. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think we've got to reclaim that and also, again, encourage our leaders and our churches to understand that ministry is more than just what happens on, on the Lord's day on Sunday or Ooh. Saturday, right? That, that, that we have, I'm going to veer into like economics of the fact that we have this real estate, we have, you know, property, we have budgets, we have bank accounts. How do we use that in ways that ultimately benefit folk beyond our four walls? Mm. And as pastors, what I've learned in my context, you've got to help, educate, teach, and guide the people toward that because some people are just okay with just having a good shouting time in church. Mm-hmm. Um, you got to tell folks, hey, like, let's right-size this budget. Let's missionize this budget. Make sure we're spending about 20 to $30 on stuff outside of us. One of the things I did, for instance, when I first got to the church, uh, to Mount Helm, is we had all these line items to feed ourselves. Mm-hmm. I said, man, we spent like, a lot of money just on eating. Mm-hmm. Can we move some of that to like start a scholarship to for JPS students who can you know going to JPS? Talking I mean going to spicy. JSU. Talking spicy. And they were like, wait a minute. Yeah. What are we gonna do with our banquet? Do y'all really need a I mean, you know, we eat all the like, do we really can we not help two or three young Ooh. kids go to college? And 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 so Love it. that just takes time. And I, I'll say this last thing, and I think one of the problems with a lot of us are younger pastors mm-hmm. is that we are we grew up in a microwave society. Mm-hmm. We don't understand that a lot of our churches still operate on a slow cook mentality. Yep. So you got to go in knowing it's going to take a minute uh, to get it. But watch this: mm-hmm. the food that was slow cooked always tastes better than the food from the microwave. That's a big fact. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool man. Look, C.J. Rose, ladies and gentlemen, a solid brother, a husband, father, community leader, pastor. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you are the youngest to hold the seat, right, at Mount Helm? Yeah. The youngest, making history. Uh, again, a solid brother. If you would, look into your camera over here and just kind of share what you think your greatest accomplishment is, as well as um, what would you tell young CJ mm-hmm. or any other young? Black brother out there. Wow. Wow. <laughs> wow. Um, so I would say I think my greatest accomplishment is not forgetting that I'm a boy from Hazelhurst. Mm. No matter what I've been able to accomplish in life, it's it's remembering, reflecting from whence I came. Wow. And I think when we're grounded in a story, in a people, in a place, it not only humanizes us, but it allows us to love and serve other people. Uh, without fear or favor. Mm. And I think wherever you are in life, looking at whatever you grew up in, that context for all, you know, it's all good, bad, and ugly. It helped to shape you into the person you are today. So it kind of keeps you humble as you continue to pursue things while also recognizing um, that despite the deficits of your childhood, 
you can't go on to do great things. If I were to talk to younger CJ, I would probably tell younger CJ, don't let it take so long for you to understand that you are enough. That you don't have to find yourself trying to impress and please other people so that they won't be intimidated by you or, uh, or, or, you know, shirk you away. I think what ends up happening for a lot of young folks that we spend so much time trying to be like other folks, trying to please other folks, trying to find our voice, uh, trying to find our identity, trying to put a claim on, on something, comparing ourselves, comparing the speed at which we're growing and adapting. Um, I want to say to you that God has providentially put you on God's timetable, not your calendar. And when you understand that you do all things perfectly in God's time and on God's uh, in God's way, uh, then you can look to yourself in the mirror and say, you know what? I'm enough. I've done enough. Nothing I do now more or less can stop God from loving me. And that encourages me to go out and love myself and love other people. That's gangster. <laughs> kid, we got one, kid. Look, hey, man. <laughs> My brother. <laughs> love you, man. Love you too, brother. Much love and respect. Look, it's Key Mark Kane coming to all of your live, your favorite country cousin, your favorite Mississippian, and your best friend. You just tapped in. What a way to end the season. Season two, the season finale of Mental Shampoo. It's been a blessing to have my brother C.J. Rhodes in the building. We talked a lot about self-awareness, so on and so forth. Look, take everything that you saw in this episode, rewatch it, take notes, share with a friend. You dig what I'm saying? See y'all on the next trip. Y'all be blessed. Peace and blessings. Love and respect.